Well, good morning, everyone. It's my privilege to bring you a message for the new year. She the message for every year, for every day of our lives. But we're gonna we're gonna take it for 2018. Let's ask our God His blessing upon this time as we come to worship Him through His Word. Would you pray? Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time together. We thank you for each and every joy and every tear in this past year. And we look forward with hope and encouragement as you lead and guide each and every one of us in our lives and as you lead this church to serve you and honor you here in our our fair city. We just thank you that you have given us that opportunity and we ask your blessing upon this time. It's in your son's name we do pray. Amen. Well, it's customary every year to sit down and say, what happened last year? And the older you get, the more you find out that last year moved a lot faster than the previous year. And you anticipate that next year is going to get faster. Yeah. (laughs) And so we have to sit down and, and sort of reflect on life and to understand what it looks like. And it's going to look differently from different people's perspective. But as believers, I think there's a couple of things that we can begin with that we can be thankful for, that we can appreciate about last year and about this year. And the first things come to mind is, first we can give thanks to God for our justification our continuing sanctification. And these gifts in salvation are truly precious gifts. And second, we can recognize that every event that's transpired, whether they are to our liking or not, are still for our good. And that God has... Well, a perfect plan. A lot of times we think of goodness and good things happen, bad things happen. And yet when you look at what God has laid out, goodness is really His goodness, His plan is being perfected. And you can have a storm that comes through and devastates an area and you say, well, that's a bad storm. And yet in that same storm it continues on and solves the drought. Therefore, it's a good storm. And yet, it's always good because God is working all things together for good for his people. And we can be thankful for that. Because we know that nothing happens outside of his will. Whether we consider it profitable and edifying to our view, eh, that doesn't necessarily mean that God isn't using it. And we struggle with that sometimes. And many of you have faced challenges, uh, financial challenges, health challenges, loss of loved ones, all sorts of challenges. And yet we know that God is still in control of all those things, and we can be thankful for that. And third, and this is one that I think maybe as Christians we need to do in a little different way than most, we need to search our hearts to see how we have responded to those events. Did we respond in a way that was glorifying to God, or did we respond in a way that wasn't? And we're not perfect. God knows that. That's why he has grace and mercy. That's why he sent his son to pay for the sins that we have. And yet we still need to reflect not on, could I have done this better? Could I have done something else? How did we reflect our lives to bring glory to God? And I think that's something that maybe as Christians we need to think on differently as we enter this new year. How am I going to live my life? And those are all good things to think about. But one thing that struck me is we need wisdom in all these things. And a lot of times we think of wisdom in in earthly sense. And this morning we're actually going to look at it from God's perspective. What does wisdom look like from God's perspective? Wisdom from above, if you will. And there's nothing wrong with what we do in our lives saying, Lord, I, I would like your your." Blessing on so many different things. I I need encouragement. I need prayer for salvation for loved ones, for lost ones, 
uh, need personal growth. I need faithfulness to that, uh, it's this time I'm going to do it gym membership. That's called praying for a miracle. <laughs> or anything else. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But wisdom is going to be involved in all of it. Every bit of it is going to require us to be wise in how we live and what we do. So that's the topic that we're going to take up this morning. Wisdom from above. And I hope that that is added to your prayers this year. God, give me wisdom from above. Before I take up the topic, though, there's a couple of things that I'd like to throw out as considerations to begin with. First off, this wisdom that we're going to talk about is for those who know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Matter of fact, you will not have this and cannot have this wisdom without that being the entering premise. And if you do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior this morning, this moment, you don't have to have a card signed. You don't have to have a prayer prayed. You don't have to have anything. Right now, right this instant, you can begin with the true wisdom from above, which is your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing you've done. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you might do, will do, that can thwart his hand. You cannot be plucked out of God's hand when you place your trust in him. And so if that's not who you are right now, I beg you, before you hear anything else, if you hear nothing else, hear that. And if you're a believer, you've already begun down this path. You already understand these things. But that doesn't mean that we can't fall into not thinking, not having wisdom from above in our life. We can walk in a way that is not glorifying. And so... The rest of this message, this is for you. This is for me. This is for all of us. And our main passage this morning we're going to be looking at is James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. But I'm going to have to do a couple of things before we get there. And we're going to ask ourselves five questions. And hopefully at least some basic answer because this topic is, is large. But here's the five questions we're going to ask and hopefully answer. First off, what is wisdom? If we need wisdom from above, we need to know what wisdom looks like. What is it? Secondly, how important is it? Can I just live my life not being so wise? Don't want to be a wise guy? How important is it? Third, where does it begin? Where does wisdom begin if we know what it is, we know how important it is, where do we begin with wisdom? And if we've begun in wisdom, the next question is naturally, how do we grow in wisdom? And finally, if we think we understand it, we know it's important, we've begun with it, we're growing in it, how do we recognize what does it look like? Is it because I've studied a book, I've come to a church, I've read a sermon, I, you know, whatever? What does it look like? So that we have some hope of evaluating what wisdom looks like. So let's begin with our first question. What is wisdom? And I'm going to be blunt. For many years, I've always looked at wisdom from a perspective that was the wrong perspective. Maybe you have too. But when you look at wisdom, you have to look at it from how the Bible presents what wisdom is. We're so trained to think this is wise, that person's wise. Well, are they? So we're going to begin looking at what wisdom is from a biblical perspective. And many times, and this is, a, this is partially true, uh, how many of you have heard of wisdom is applied knowledge? Sounds good. And it's partially true. But uh, as I've been teaching through 1 Corinthians, Paul pretty much said, Corinthians, you've got it. You have the facts down. You've, by the way, you've missed it because you don't even understand it because you have no love attached to the, to the knowledge you have. Because they were, had knowledge and they were not applying it properly, therefore they were not wise. Not that they had knowledge and applied it. They had knowledge and misapplied it. And so a lot of times we think that application of knowledge is wisdom. 
I think there's a better definition, and I'll call this a working definition. This isn't some high-level theology. I, I like to be able to state things in ways that I can understand it easily and ask myself questions. I like to ask questions. Here's how I would define wisdom, and I believe this is, will be borne out in the scriptures we're going to look at this morning. Wisdom is seeing and thinking about life from God's perspective and we don't stop there. And then acting in accord with God's thoughts and ways. Let me say that again. Wisdom is seeing and thinking about life from God's perspective. And then acting in accordance with God's thoughts and ways. And when you look at the Bible, you see wisdom and folly, the wise man and the fool, very often set in contrast to one another. And with this definition, I was, I was thinking about it, and you realize that all you have to do is change one word in the definition to get a fool or foolishness or folly. And that word is substitute God and replace God with man. And suddenly you get foolishness. And so the antonym, if you will, of wisdom is foolishness is seeing and thinking about life from man's perspective and then acting in accord with man's thoughts and ways. How guilty are we of that? As believers, thinking my way, my way, my thoughts, my solutions, my answers, and we never stand back and say, what are God's thoughts, God's ways, and God's answers? Without that, we become fools, even as believers. So that's what I believe the Bible describes as wisdom. So that's what is wisdom. Our second question is, though, how important is that? Hopefully the answer is obvious, but let's, let's take a look at it. Proverbs 4.7 says this, and there's various translations of it, but I like this, this version. The beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom. And with your acquiring get understanding. And you're like, how in the world is the beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom? Well, that presupposes the fact that you have wisdom. And the fact is, we don't. Man is not wise. And you're like, well, wait a second. I, I got up here. I got dressed. I, I made it here this morning. It's got to count for something. Well, it does. But when we're talking about biblical wisdom... You're not going to find wisdom in yourself. I'm not going to find it in myself. As a matter of fact, what am I going to find? And what are you going to find? We're going to find foolishness. To begin to know you need wisdom is to know you don't have it. I think that's kind of an important thing. Because if we go about our lives believing we have it, what are we? We're fools. And thus, there is a high priority on acquiring wisdom, and with the wisdom, getting understanding. Because wisdom isn't just some ethereal thing that's floating out there. It's something that you have to understand what to do with it, right? What is wisdom without application? And so recognition that we don't have it and we must acquire it is the first step. And secondly, when we acquire it, we have to understand it. And in this particular Proverbs, I found it was kind of interesting, is in Proverbs chapter, or chap, Proverb 4, if you will, this proverb sets wisdom in the context that said, if you have this wisdom, it will provide protection and give honor to those who love and seek after it. I think that's a pretty, pretty important thing coming, for this coming year. We need protection. We need honor. And we need to love to seek wisdom. So wisdom itself is what is necessary for life, to live it in a way that honors God. Therefore, it's very important. Matter of fact, it's probably the most important thing that we need to be doing. I need wisdom, God, to live in accordance with your thoughts and ways that my actions will reflect that. 
And so that's how important wisdom is. Third question. Where does wisdom begin? And you're like, well, didn't it begin with recognition that you don't have wisdom? Yeah. But the fact that you recognize that you didn't have wisdom and I don't have wisdom says, but now where do I go from there? How do I, how do I begin this? And Proverbs 9, 10 tells us, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And Proverbs 4, 7 told us that we need to acquire wisdom and when we acquire it, we need understanding. Well, to begin to acquire this wisdom, first off, we have to recognize that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of it. In other words, this relationship, this understanding of who he is, who God is, not who we make him out to be or who we want him to be, but who he is. And he is a God to be honored, revered, and feared. I mean, think about it. The creator of the universe, you want him mad at you? I don't. He is to be feared. He is the one that, that can destroy body and soul. He is the one who has all authority over everything. This is one to be honored. And you say, okay, well, that's the beginning of wisdom. And it says, and knowledge is the understanding of the Holy One is understanding. In other words, now that I have recognized who he is in that fear and that awe, now I can begin to understand as I acquire this wisdom. And that understanding is who he is, the Holy One, the one who is set apart. So we already have begun to see that wisdom is not about us. Wisdom is about him. Wisdom is not about our plans. It's about his plans. It's not about our power. It's about his power. It's about who he is. And therefore, we will gain understanding through that. And so we, we teach here at this church attributes of God. We've, some of you have read knowing God. Well, why do we do that? We want everybody to know who he is. This is the Lord you serve. This is the Lord you worship. This is the Lord we follow. This is what a disciple does. A follower of the Lord. So that's how it begins. Continuing on though. Proverbs 1.7 says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and fools despise wisdom and instruction. So here it is. Here's man, the fool, says, I don't want what you have, God. I don't want wisdom. I don't want instruction. I refuse it. That's what a fool is. So what is man's thinking? Well, Paul tells us that in Romans 1, 18 through 22, he says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. Have you ever wondered how long it takes for God to condemn mankind? Here's, here's, here's what it takes. For since the creation of the world... His invisible attributes, his internal power, divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. That's all it takes. I didn't hear the gospel. No, you looked at creation itself and ignored God. That's it. It says, for even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God. So this isn't about being spiritual. This isn't about being religious. This isn't about having lots of head knowledge. It says, yes, you know all about him. Matter of fact, you can see him in creation and you reject him. They are without excuse. Does that make you want to pray more for salvation in this coming year? For God to open eyes? And be so sad for the foolishness of mankind? Because we all have been there. And yet, what happens? They did not honor him as God, nor give thanks. Thankfulness is something that his children should be thankful. But they became futile in their speculation. In other words, futile means it is a waste of time.
time. You're not going to figure it out. It's not going to come to the conclusion that it's supposed to. Futile speculation. And you can spend all your days studying philosophy. You can spend all your days studying morality. You can spend all your days studying spirituality, ethics, philosophy. You name it, it is still foolish speculation. And what happens when we foolishly speculate? And they're foolish, man-centered, man-thoughts. That foolish heart that comes along with it. And that heart is who you are, the essence of your being. Not your emotions, not your feelings. Who you are was darkened. Verse 22 says, professing to be wise, they became fools. And see, if that's the path you're traveling down, you've not begun down the path of wisdom. Because there is no wisdom. There is just futility. There is a waste of your time and energy. I've studied philosophy and morality and ethics and all. There's some cool stuff and you can get into great debates and all that kind of stuff. But it is still not wisdom that we need. And so instead of fearing him, instead of having knowledge and understanding of him, the fool hates wisdom, despises wisdom, and doesn't want to be instructed. How many of you had one of those wonderful conversations with family members over the holidays trying to love and graciously lead them to true wisdom in our Lord and Savior? And I bet you got a really good response most of the time. Oh, yeah, that's really great. Thank you. No. No. You got people who said, I hate this wisdom. I do not like this instruction. Don't tell me that. And that's sad. That's why we need to pray more and more for God's spirit and hearts in this coming year. Because this is what it brings without wisdom from above. So we know where it begins, what it is, how important it is. Well, how do we grow in it? Because this is where we have to continue to grow. All of us have to continue to grow in wisdom. And this is where we're moving into the book of James. And this is where James picks up this topic right at the beginning of the book. He says, in James 1.5, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. You're like, well, that was easy. Just ask. And he's going to give it to you generously. I mean, it's not skin, you know, it's like, here, I'll give you a penny. Maybe just a little, a little wisdom, beg me a little more. And without reproach, it's like, well, you should have known that one. I've been telling you that one. Didn't you sit in Sunday school class? Didn't you hear that sermon on wisdom? Didn't you get it? I was going to tell you that I just figured I'd get wisdom from above, so I just winged the sermon. Probably not a wise thing to do, would it? God says, I will grant this to you generously. Just ask me. How many of us have forgotten to say, Lord, I really need help? Isn't that hard for us sometimes? I got it all figured out. I've walked with the Lord for 50 years. I don't need any help. Yes, you do. All of us do. It doesn't matter how many years you walk with the Lord. We need help. We need wisdom. It's something that is critical to us. And God says, all you have to do is ask. You're like, well, that's easy. What happens? Do I get hit with something? No. God has given us so many different ways that we can ask and so many different means we can find it. First off, it's in his word, right? And his word speaks to his son. And you have saints around you. To, we are to provoke one another to love and good deeds. And we have seniors who have been around and lived life and have a perspective on saying, let me show you what God has done. And we have young people who say, I have questions I need answered. And we have everybody in between. You have wisdom that God gives through his people, through his word, in his son. We are supposed to have the mind of Christ, right? We're supposed to be imitators of like Paul said, be imitators of me as I, as I am of Christ. All these things God gives us and says, use them. Ask. You need help with something. There's somebody here, I almost guarantee you, somebody sitting here right now who can help you. Just ask. Say, God, show me. And God is going to be gracious. 
He is a father who loves his children. He says, I want you to be like my son. I want to conform you to the image of it. And last year we did some conforming, and this year we're going to do some more. And that may hurt. I'm not going to tell you that it won't. Matter of fact, I almost guarantee you that it will. If you have the Camelot life, hold on when you ask that. Because God is going to show you. Camelot is not where growth comes from. But I think that's exciting. We just have to ask. And we will continue to grow in wisdom. We will continue to grow in grace. We will continue to grow in the knowledge of God. We will continue all these things. And therefore, once we grow in them, we should therefore live them out. Because now we have the thinking. We have the understanding. We can say, I understand, God, what you would want. I understand, God, how you would have me live. And I am going to look at it from your perspective, not my perspective. And therefore, I am going to act on it. Because it doesn't stop with knowledge in the head. It's not the wise sage who sits on the mountaintops and dispenses wisdom. It's like, well, what are you doing? If you're not doing, we're going to see that here in a second. Now, there's a caveat. There's always a catch. Because James said, but he must ask in faith without any doubting. Ah, there's the catch. Yes, God, give it to me. But for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For the man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And see, God says, if you want my wisdom, you have to trust me for it. And if you don't trust me for it, you're not going to get it. Because you're double-minded. Here's the way the world thinks. Here's what I want. Here's the way I'm perceiving stuff. Here's what God thinks. And you're trying to do both simultaneously. I'm trying to do both simultaneously. He said, what? He's not saying I'm denying it from you. Just your thinking alone will eliminate the ability to have wisdom from above. You can't, you know, you remember when you were painting? Let's mix those colors. Oh, that's a pretty yellow, and there's a pretty red, and there's a pretty blue, and there's a pretty whatever, and we mix them all together, and we get mud. That's what you get. That's what double-minded, unstable, you get mud instead of the beautiful art that you could have had because we doubt. You understand why the man said, Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief? Because we need help. We need faith. We need encouragement because we need wisdom. And therefore, we need to be thinking in those terms. God, I know you can give it. I've seen you've given it. I'm going to trust you for it. I think that's probably the hardest thing because we start doubting. Can he give it? Yeah. Will he give it? Maybe. Will he give it to me? I don't know. And guess what the answer is? You just answered it. No. He says, don't expect it. So there's another prayer. God, I expect it. I know you're going to give it. And I'm going to brace myself because I don't know how you're going to give it, but I know you are. I don't know what class I should be in. Show me. I don't know who I should be ministering to. Show me. I don't know who I need to help me with this. Show me because I know you will. So that's how we grow in wisdom. That's just the tip of the iceberg. So let's look at our last question. What does wisdom look like? We ask for it. We know we can have it. We know it's important. We know where it begins. We know how to grow in it. But what does it look like? Well, our main text. James 3.13 says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Okay, he's asking a question. Who is wise and understanding among you? You have wisdom. You understand the knowledge of the Holy One. Who is that? And he gives an answer. By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. 
So in other words, it isn't about how you look, dress, talk. It's about what you do. If you want to see what wisdom looks like, not sounds like, because there's a lot of people who have lots of wise sounding words, but if you said, that's not where wisdom lies. Wisdom lies in action. And he says, let him show this by his good conduct. Good conduct, as I mentioned earlier, goodness relies in how much are you following what God's plans and purposes are. Goodness going through difficulty. Goodness going through trials and saying, I will honor my God. I will think in his ways. I will walk in his ways. See how wisdom now walks. Wisdom now shows. Wisdom doesn't just talk. And he says, by his good conduct, let him show his works. Okay? Good conduct Show his works. Now, we're going to find out here in a second that James is going to be very careful and make sure we understand what good conduct looks like versus not good conduct. And he's going to give us a way to distinguish what, con what good conduct. And then he says, there's a qualification to this. It says, a meekness of wisdom. Now, this isn't about look how good I am, or who I can draw to myself. Isn't that one of the characteristics of a false teacher, drawing people unto themselves, leading away the flock? He says, that's not what it's about. It's about meekness in wisdom. Now, sometimes you got to be a roaring lion. But most of the time, wisdom says meekness. Wisdom's going to say gentleness. Wisdom's going to say self-control and all sorts of other things. Wisdom is not going to be boastful. Wisdom is going to be meek as it works in good conduct. That's why he asks, who is it? That's the person. That's what wisdom looks like. Now, to be clear, James wants to make sure that we don't miss what that says. He could have ended with that statement. But he says, I want to make sure you understand so that you can observe it. Okay, you can now observe what this looks like. And in verses 14 through 16, he says, okay, I told you to have good conduct. Now let me explain to you what good conduct does not look like. He says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. For this is not wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic for the jealousy and where jealousy and selfish ambition exist there will be disorder and every vile practice so if you want to know what wisdom looks like it doesn't look like this and we could spend weeks looking at jealousy bitter jealousy and selfish ambition now if you notice here it doesn't say well, I, I kind of like that that's it I saw some new cars in the parking lot hey I like that new car that's not jealousy. That's just, hey, I like that new car. But when it goes, I don't have that car, and that person shouldn't have that car, that's mine. Now you've got bitter jealousy. Ambition? Is there anything wrong with being ambitious? No. Aren't we zealous for good works? Don't we want to work hard? Don't we want to serve with our whole heart? Yeah, that's ambitious. Because we want to do that. I want to step up this year. I want to do more. But when it becomes selfish, it's about me. If you notice here, both of these things that, that James is saying, he says, if it's about you and about what you want and about what you get, and no matter how hard you work, no matter what, if it's about you, you've missed it. Because what's going to come with that attitude? The me attitude, is that a God attitude? Did he not humble himself? Did he not give up glory for us? Did he not sacrifice his own son and pour out wrath upon him? Is that how God thinks? He could have, couldn't he? But he didn't. Because if that exists, if that kind of thinking exists, he says, don't boast and be false to the truth. In other words, he says, yes, I'm wise. And he says, no, you're not. Stop boasting that you are because you're not. You're lying against what the truth says of what wisdom looks like. 
you're boasting in the wrong thing. And what comes with it? He says, this, what, this isn't wisdom from above. This is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Earthly, not heavenly. Unspiritual, in other words, nothing to do with something beyond ourselves. Demonic. Now, we could go into forever on those, but I think you get the picture. Is any of those things good? Earthly, unspiritual, demonic. I, I don't put those on the positive list of attributes of anything. Four, where, selfish, where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder, or chaos, if you will, and every vile practice. So when you look around life, and you look around your home, and you look around your family, and you look around work, what happens when chaos, when, when you get selfish ambition and jealousy? People start getting chaotic. Things start going out of control. We start doing things we shouldn't be doing. Chaos starts happening. Disorder. God is a God of order and a God of peace, not one of disorder. He says, so once you start thinking this way, once you start seeing these things, what's going to follow every vile practice? Think about this. We have a, and I'm not picking on protests because that's a right we have in our country, but you start with a peaceful protest, right? I don't like this or change this or free this person. Fine. But then what happens when that nice peaceful protest becomes a rowdy protest? Nice words are exchanged, right? And we're thinking, thank you, here, let me bring you something for what you need to drink so I can help you stay out here protesting longer. And yet, it goes from there to throwing rocks, to breaking windows, to rioting, to looting, that's what happens. And that's just an example. And it happens in mine from the two-year-old to whack with the three-year-old to who knows what happens when you get to be the teenager. Right? That's what happens when we have wisdom that isn't from above, when it's jealousy and selfish ambition. Chaos. So when you look around and you say, my life is chaos, my home is chaos, my business is chaos, my church is chaos, what do you think is going to happen next? Wow, I'm shocked they did that. No, that's what's going to happen. Guaranteed. So if you notice that's not wisdom from above. So we don't want any of that, but it's easy to see. Verse 17, though, says, what does it look like? And this is important for us. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. I like those. Except they're really, really hard, aren't they? Just take a, we're going to just look at these really briefly. First, pure. Purity is essentially not mixing one thing with another. In other words, the nice colors that get mixed together, you no longer have pure colors, you have mud. Purity can even appear on the surface to look pure, and yet it's mixed with false motive, right? A lot of people like to look good. Church is the place you look good, you dress good, your kids behave. Once they get in the car, all bets are off. Eh. That's not pure. That's putting on a, that's hypocrisy. That's, that's mixing what I want to look like in front of my friends with the reality of who I really am. Maybe that person that you're putting on the front to could actually be helping you with the kids. You missed out. Peaceable. So this word is focused on working together in harmony, not fighting a strife. God made peace with sinners, and we should be peaceable with one another. We maintain the unity that God has given us in his spirit. Now, does that mean you can't discuss anything? No, I can't discuss anything because I'm in trouble. Does that mean that you can't have various views on things? No. Does that mean that we can't like other things? No. 
But when we have interaction in those differences, those discussions, that learning, that growth, those differences of opinion, there's grace and humility and working together because it's peaceable, gentle. And the emphasis on this is, if you will, not pushing or bullying for your own way. It doesn't mean you can't be even correct, but how you do it is going to make a difference. Now, there are some times we do have to stand strong, and there are times we have to do that. But generally, wisdom from above is gentle. That's in parenting. That's in with your spouse, at work, with sports teams, you name it, wherever it is, gentle. Don't tell that to your football coach. No. They're not going to appreciate that. You can gently knock them on their backside. Um, Open to reason. With prior elements in place, purity, peaceableness, gentleness, people can be willing to discuss things. Open to reason. When emotion gets involved and harshness gets involved and challenges get involved, nobody's listening. I've said this before, and any of you who I've given counsel to, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. All of your knowledge and all of the things you could help them with will be meaningless if you don't have gentleness and purity and peaceableness and kindness and grace in what you do. Then it's going to be open to reason. And guess what? Lots of us need to be reasonable. I need to be more reasonable. The older you get, the more reasonable you need to become because the more you know, the more set in the ways you get because I've heard that Sunday school class before, don't need to know anymore. I can guarantee you I've learned more about wisdom by just studying for this sermon than I've ever known about wisdom before. I've walked with the Lord for 53 years. You're going, wow, it took him that long to figure this out. (laughs) Some of us are slower than others. Full of mercy and good fruits. Merciful. Bearing good fruits. Not worrying about what went wrong, but having mercy and grace on those who fail. Because we all fail. God had mercy on us, didn't he? Doesn't mean there aren't consequences. But mercy and grace and full of good fruits. In other words, I'm going to be showing in my life the goodness of God. Impartial. That's a hard one. Being impartial is really, really, really difficult. Because isn't it so much easier to say, well, I like that person. Well, that person didn't do so bad. Well, that one I'm not care for. I'm going to jump on them. I'm going to help that person because I like them. But I'm not going to help that person because, yeah, whatever. I don't like them that much. And yet... The scriptures tell us to love our enemies. I don't know about you, but the definition of an enemy is not somebody I like typically, right? Hi, this is the person I like. They're my enemy. Let me introduce you to them. I don't think those words go together. Somebody who's your enemy is not somebody you particularly care for. And typically they don't care for you much either. And yet we are to love them. Can you be impartial? Can I be impartial when you're dealing with an enemy? Or somebody you don't like. Even the Gentiles love those who love them. Impartiality is hard. And yet that's what wisdom from above looks like. It's impartial. I love you enough, even if you're my friend, my spouse, my child, to care for you. Because that's what our Heavenly Father does when he brings trials and discipline to us. I love you so much, I will bring this to you. And again, gentle, peaceable, all the other things full of reason. That doesn't mean mean or nasty. And sincere. In other words, this isn't begrudging. This is a true approach that I love you and I care for you and I really am trying to do this properly. There's no alternative motives. It's not I'm trying to get something. It's I am sincerely, graciously caring for you. And when God brings something to us, or challenges us, it is sincere, isn't it? 
It's pure. It's for our benefit, our good. And so this is what wisdom from above looks like. And that's where the show in their good conduct, in works, in meekness, that's what this looks like. These are just a set of pictures. So we ask ourselves, is that how our world was this last year? Is this is how our world would see us this coming year? Are we looking at things from a wisdom perspective? Because there's a benefit to it. In verse 18, it says, And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. There's no ambition in it. If you do, you're going to get chaos and evil things. There's peace. There will be a harvest of righteousness. Don't you want to plant a harvest of righteousness this year? God, give my life so that it can be a harvest of righteousness. Help me sow in peace. Help me be a peacemaker. Because Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. For what? They shall be called the sons of God. And we loop right back around to what does it mean to have wisdom from above is to know God and to act like our Heavenly Father, to honor Him in all our ways, to think from His perspective, to see from His perspective, to act from His perspective. That is wisdom from above. So we have to ask ourselves as we come into this new year, do we see and think about life from God's perspective and then act accordingly? Or are we foolish? Because believers, we can be foolish. We follow our own thoughts and ways. Are we wise as the scriptures tell us? I hope this will encourage you to dig in more, not just to become smarter, to become more knowing of our God. The more you know God, the more all of this is like, I can't even think about myself, Lord. I can only think of you and others. No selfish ambition here. No jealousy. And do our lives portray that behavior that's consistent with the heavenly wisdom? Or is there a lot of strife and chaos going on? Because that's the wisdom of man, and that's called foolishness. So may our thoughts and our prayers, followed by our actions, reflect wisdom from above in the coming year. And not just the coming year. For as long as he gives us breath on this earth, or until he returns, that should be our prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the grace and the mercy that we have in your Son. And we thank you that we get to know the Holy One. And that through you, we understand what true wisdom looks like. We understand what goodness looks like. We understand all these things, but help us to constantly hold every thought captive, every idea that would dissuade us from seeking, living out the wisdom from above, the one that glorifies you, the one that shows good works, the one that is meek and peaceable and reasonable, and all the other things that are so difficult for us. We ask that. We believe that. We do not doubt that. But help us in our faith. Help us in all the things that we have to deal with each and every day because the emotions go up so quickly. The reasonableness goes away so fast. Let us be like your son. Let us be conformed to him as his image because he gave up everything for us and to glorify your name. It's in his name we do pray. Amen.